Well, 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 here we are again, and I have my lovely friend and competitor, Mysterious River, formerly known as uh, the Holy Emperor, as well as Red Lightning, back in the arcade days. How are you doing, man? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for having this interview with me, Drax. That's a pleasure. Um, so for those who don't know you, just give us an introduction about yourself and what you represent. Sure. Um, so uh, um, let's talk about my um, Tekken gaming history. So my very first series Tekken was uh, Tekken 5 DR. And back in the days, I used to go to the arcades on Queen Street. So uh, they were Ethan's and Time Zone. Uh, I guess uh, my friend Richard, aka AMS, he's a, he, he was a, a fame main. I'm not sure if he still plays, but I think he still plays online. But he just doesn't go to uh, any off thing anymore. He was uh, the one that introduced me to the arcade scene. And, and I guess I've always been quite competitive ever since I uh, started going to the arcades because uh, back in those days, you had to pay like a dollar or sometimes even two dollars to, uh, to play a game. And since nobody wanted to uh, lose, so we were all very competitive. And, and uh, most of us were still like, uh, I was going to high school and then later on university and, uh, you know, I, I met a lot of the victim players such as Thomas, you know, aka Abuji, uh, Jamie, Zazob, and Vince, and um, Cold Fire, etc. And they were all kind of like going to university at the time, so nobody was like earning a lot of money, so everyone was very competitive. Um, yeah, um, but in terms of uh, going to competitions, uh, I started going to competitions uh, during Tekken 6. Uh, BR especially, because that's when Time Zone started organizing a lot of domestic and even international events. Uh, so I wasn't, even though back in the days, I wasn't like the top, top players, uh, because uh, back in the days, we had like what I call them the three kingdoms. So basically the three best players in New Zealand. Uh, they were uh, BG, uh, Thomas, and Zazo, so Jamie. Yeah. Uh, but I was always kind of in that top eight, top ten ish. You know what I mean? So I was, I was there, but not quite there yet. Um, yeah. But during Tekken Tag Two era, I think uh, the RK kind of started dying because uh, console kind of got released very early on, and uh, the Time Zone machines, the the RK machines didn't update properly, and it had a very strange kind of uh, RK stick that like was longer than the normal one, yeah, so they yeah. wasn't comfortable to use. And uh, uh, the screens were, were kind of laggy as well. So everyone kind of stopped going to the arcades, like the old school uh, players uh, from my era. Uh, and then I guess because people, you know, started working and everything. But I continued to play, like, by going to my friend's house on the weekend. Like, uh, I used to go to Chikake's house, so aka Cookie Cutter, uh, together with Sevio and Thomas almost every weekend. Um, so we had this kind of uh, private session, uh, and that's how I like, kind of like um, still maintain a level of uh, competitiveness, if you will. Yeah. Uh, then I kind of stopped for about one one and a half, maybe two years, uh, because of my personal reasons. Um, it was until late two thousand seventeen. Like I never touched vanilla or seven point oh at all. Uh, but in in late in, uh, 2017, one day Thomas called me up and he says, oh, did you know Saint is coming for a TWT event? And I was like, what the hell was a TWT event? Because back in the day, I didn't even know what a TWT event was. And and he obviously, Thomas explained it to me and says, oh, Saint is coming, Saint is coming. I said, you sure? He said, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was like, okay, now I gotta go buy a PS4, and I, so I went to buy a PS4, and I bought, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Tekken 7, and I started training. So I was literally two weeks into the game before I entered the TWT event. Yeah. Jesus, uh, man. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, then I think uh, after that event, I, I kind of, I didn't go to any of the offline tournaments until 2000, late 2018. Uh, I, I um, participated in Southern Cross Up, um, where I got second. And then I um, obviously went to the uh, Christmas Damager as well. And in 2019, that's where, um, that's the year uh, 
when I decided to like fully come back to the community and become competitive again. Uh, so 2019, I had a very flung year. Uh, I think I, I participated in almost every uh, handbats and rambats and major tournaments domestically. And I also had two international master events, which was Band 11 and uh, uh, Evo 19. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, do you get this a lot? Do you get a lot of players that ask mm -hmm. about you and then when they discover you know how long you've been around they're like oh I, I i i never knew you were you know like they they're so surprised that you've been in the scene for that long because even me myself i've had faint memories of running into you at the arcades like yeah. a few times and even at nationals you're one of those few yeah. players i've never run into a lot in tournament you know but when i do yes. it's always it's always interesting uh yes actually um i think for some reason, and I didn't expect that, a lot of even the new players, when I first met them, like Wowser, when I first met him in 2018, uh, uh, and like uh, Dan and other players, they seem to know me. Like, and Kyo, uh, he used to go to the um, offline scene quite a lot, right? I didn't know this person uh, until I met him in 2017. Uh, but they seem to know me. So I think uh, uh, because I didn't go to the arcades after BR, I, I very rarely went to the arcades, so I'm not surprised that a lot of the new players, like new players to me, they didn't know me. But w once I told them about, uh, you know, kind of my history, my Tekken history, they they definitely get surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess I, I, I'll I'll mention a moment. You had uh, you were at Bama Eleven, and you got to meet yes. your your idol like you you met Yamasa Yu and I know you're yes. a big, you are a big supporter of the Japan style of, of Tekken why yes. is that so um I think it's because uh when I started playing uh Tekken my very first character was Brian right um mm, but because uh my good friend uh also he was my mentor uh Richard he 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 made fame right and uh, I thought, you know what, Fang is actually a really cool character. I really like the character design. And I wasn't going, I, I guess I wasn't really going anywhere with Brian. So I started picking up Fang. And back in the days, like, there were um, two very famous Fang players. And both of them were Japanese. And one of them were Yamasa Yu. And the other one was called Taizo. I don't think a lot of people even know him I, I know nowadays. Too. Yeah. You know, right? Only the old school players, um, you know, know uh, these know about these uh, Japanese players. So I I didn't know any thing player from uh, Korea back in the day. I didn't know there was how there was you know. I just nobody was playing thing in mm. Korea. Uh, that's why I I've always watched Japanese Tekken mainly because of uh, there were way more thing players in Japan as opposed to Korea, and that's why I picked up the Japanese play style. And uh, they seem to be like think like the Japanese style uh, is very appealing to me. Yeah. Yeah. So running into Yamasa, you you having that first to three set with him and feeling a sense yeah. of accomplishment, but you're paying your respect, and also you run into me at Evo in yes. your pools as well. Yeah. So what was that like having that kind of overseas experience? Uh, so it was definitely like uh, eye opener. Uh, it was a really, really uh, very, very interesting and uh, um, exciting experience for me because uh, before that, I had always wanted to play against the international players. And after playing especially me, I, I have learned a lot from just the sets I played against him. And uh, after, the, uh, after the games, I asked him for advice and he gave me some tips. And those tips, actually, I, I managed to kind of sit down and let them think in and uh, process the tips. And then uh, I incorporated it into my current gameplay. So, um, and I, after playing the international players, I realized uh, what was a lack in my gameplay and what, uh, what are the, some of the things I needed to um, improve in my, in my gameplay. Uh, for example, sp spacing, or according to me, space control, uh, be more patient, uh, and, and things like that, yeah. So it was definitely good experience. And I would recommend anyone who takes Tekken very seriously um, to like maybe go to at least one international uh, event where they, can, uh, they will be able to play against uh, the top players from overseas. Yeah. It will definitely help them to improve. 
and uh, help them to develop more concepts that we might not be able to develop just in New Zealand. Yeah, I've had this talk with a few other players, the Evo experience, how you need a lot of patience and endurance, because it's not like any locals that we have where you can just find a free toilet or a free, you know, bot you know what I mean? Like get, go to a free cafe, yeah. go to a cafe with space to have a bottle of water. Like it's, it's, it's very hard, I've been told. Yes, it was definitely something that I had to endure because uh, at EVO, um, so fortunately I was, the, I was actually the last man of standing. So because uh, I survived uh, many, many rounds, um, and by the time I, I, I played against uh, B, B Kun from Japan, which was my last game because I lost to him, um, I was totally, totally uh, exhausted because... Uh, um, you couldn't bring your own food and water into uh, the venue because uh, they had very strict um, security measures, all right? They would check your bags, and if you had a bottle of water, they would ask you to toss the water out. And you can bring the empty, or you could bring the empty bottle in, but you couldn't bring any water or food in, into the venue. So you had to line up, and it was a massive line. Uh, to uh, use the fountain, the water fountain, and you had to line up again, a massive, uh, a massive queue to buy food. Uh, so by the time I think I got to my last game, um, I I had already been in the venue for more than eight hours without any uh, proper food, uh, just a little bit of water. Yeah. Jesus. So I know, I know. So. Uh, it was a bit about not just about your uh, your brain, but it was also about your physical strength and your your endurance. Yeah, I see. Yeah. What were some of the matches that you got to watch and experience that unfortunately didn't get shown on stream? Because I heard there were some really cool matchups, man. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, uh, matchups that weren't uh, unfortunately weren't recorded on stream. Um, and if not for Petro Rose, who uh, you know was the cameraman, as you can see, this uh, knee, um, the the game between me and knee was recorded by him as well. If not for him, a lot of the matches would have gone lost, right? And even so, there were a lot of good matches were uh, weren't recorded. For example, uh, Royston, Royston, Cornwallis is good mate from Christ, uh, from Wellington. Um, so the very first game of the second day, he played against Asla Nash. Uh, unfortunately, that footage was not recorded and therefore eternally lost. And uh, I, I believe Wowser played against uh, Ran was it either Rancho or Lohai, one of them. And uh, that wasn't recorded as well. Uh, yeah, and I, I myself recorded some of the Yamasa Yu's games. Um, but that's just because uh, he is my idol, and uh, uh, I recorded him for my own um, kind of a study as well. Yeah. So yeah, but a lot of the good games were unfortunately not recorded. Did you share any moment with um, you at Evo? Yes, we. Um, uh, as you know, I, I because I had a lot of a conversations with him at Ban, and I played as friendly three, uh, you know, first of three games against him. Then so at Evil, when I saw him, we were kind of already know each other. So uh, we started to talk about more about um, what are the opponents we're going to run into at this event and and things like that. And in terms of uh, uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of Fane, so we kind of kind of had this. Uh, discussion about our characters as well and I also because uh, obviously the second day the first game I was going to play against the Holy Knee so I kind of asked him oh so I'm gonna play against Holy Knee uh, do you have any advice as to how I could maybe uh, survive against Knee <laughs> and and he was like oh well you just have to play to the best of your ability and 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 I when I'll tell you something real funny when uh, Nobi came along all right, and I said, "Oh, no visa, no visa. I got Lee. What, what should I do against Lee?" And guess what? Guess what? No said. What did he say? No be look at me and then start laughing. I says, "Oh, good luck, more." <laughs> He's just like, "Good luck." <laughs> <laughs> and I and I asked the low high and uh, cherry cherry berry mango the same question. And guess what? Cherry berry mango said to me. He said, "If I knew how to beat me." I would be number one now. <laughs> Man, bloody yeah, hell. That was pretty funny. Yeah, I yeah. mean, having that kind of experience 
for next year, well, for next time or for next year or whenever, um, what's one thing that you'll definitely do to prep for Evo? Uh, I think uh, one thing I definitely prep for Evo would be, um, I, I guess, having more uh, character knowledge. Uh, because uh, in the past, I, I have to admit that um, I, at least for Tekken 7, I never like, I never took that game to a level where I studied the game very, very hard mm. uh, or very um, like in depth. I kind of just uh, um, used my fundamentals and the experience and the ability to uh, read my opponent uh, to kind of like um, to keep myself in the, um, I guess you could say the top level. But uh, because nowadays uh, the new players uh, are, are very smart. They get a lot of resources to study as well. So they their improvement, the the rate of improvement is a lot faster than the old old school players. Because uh, we uh, back in our days, we we didn't have a um, this many of uh, these many of resources yeah. for us to kind of learn. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I could only. Uh, you know, but if I was only using my experience, and uh, I could only go so far. Yeah. And so, after Evo, I I think that I learned that I need to have more character knowledge. I need to have a more in-depth knowledge about the uh, Tekken Seven system and the game itself, rather than just use my previous experience, my legacy fundamental uh, skills, and my ability to read my opponent. Uh, that's just one side. Yeah. So the other side is that I need to really learn my matchups. Yeah. Need to know um, uh, different characters. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's yeah. A, it's a common trope though for players. We tend to study the matchups that we're most likely going to run into, rather than yeah. maybe the low tier, the not so popular characters that we won't run into. So I get what you mean though, because you'd want to study for a Brian, you'd want to study for a Dragonoff, because that's probably what you're going to run into. Not a yeah. lucky Chloe and not a Gigas. But if seasons four taught us anything, it's like there's a lot more of these lower tier characters starting to be used more often. Yeah. Also, um, because uh, if you think about evil and compare to our thing, right? Like our thing, the New Zealand thing is growing. Uh, don't get me wrong; it's growing bigger and bigger, and that's ex it's, that's very exciting to see. But uh, compared to evil, uh, the sheer number of uh, competitors entering, uh, you know, is not comparable. So in New Zealand, maybe you only need to prepare for let's say twenty characters. Yep. And you probably will never be able to run into, let's say, a Lucky Chloe or a Katarina player. But at EVO, at any time, you'll, you'll run into yep. a Lucky Chloe or Katarina or Akuma or something, right? Yep. So you, you really got to be prepared if you're going to an international level uh, event. So what is your title? You were, just so we get it clear, for those who don't really understand, you were the highest placed New Zealand Tekken player at an Evo exclamation yes. mark. No one else has come. Like that is that is that's your title. That's your mental. Yes, yes. So I came 49th, uh, which granted me a point and granted me my name to be on that um uh, I guess it is a, a official TWT list yeah. for Evo and anyone that got a, a point uh, was listed on the list. So fortunately I was uh, because I got to 49th I I, my name was actually um, on that list. And uh, also, I think one thing I was definitely proud of is that uh, at both Ban and uh, EVO, so both of them are master event, uh, you know, I mean, EVO was a master plus, but another uh, list, they, they both are master event. I was actually the highest uh, placed fame player in both events. So I actually exceeded even Yamasa Yu and the other, like, uh, famous, I guess, uh, fame players. So that's something definitely I'm very proud of. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's incredible. And I'm not afraid of uh, telling everyone. Oh, you definitely are, man. You <laughs> definitely are. Just wanted to get it on the record. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I'm really proud of that. Mm. One friend and one person I do want to shout out is, you know, your close training buddy, your friend for ages, Jamie Zazob. Um, yes. Yeah, we've kind of talked about it previously, but how is that relationship, that friendship between you guys, how is that reflected in how you guys verse each other? Um, so I've known Jamie for a very long time, like since DR, right? Um, like Tekken 5 DR. 
But I think I didn't really got to know him until like 2019. That's where I started really getting know, uh, getting, uh, getting to know him. And uh, mainly because I came back to the um, to the scene, and then uh, me, Jamie, and Wowser, we kind of went down to ha uh, Hamilton for handbats and uh, went together to uh, rambats all the time. Like almost every week, we were kind of uh, uh, training together, competing against each other. Yeah, so um, Jamie is a very, very uh, solid player, uh, good fundamentals, um, and he knows about the game uh, a lot, right? He has a lot of knowledge and matchup knowledge and uh, just a lot of knowledge in the game. So playing against him every week, a week, week definitely uh, helped me in terms of uh, learning, especially like Julia uh, and uh, some fundamentals uh, about the game. Mm. Does his Julia frustrate you at all? Because I know, uh, this... I know for me, and I know for other people, yeah. it's like, this guy just, you can't, it finds really, it's really hard to, to lock down Julia, it seems. Yeah, I mean, um, for a long time, um, before I started playing against Zazo, like, uh, consecutively every week for more than a year, right? Like, before that, I've... Julia was kind of my personal worst matchup. I mean, at the same time, Finn it has been or had been actually um, Zazob's worst ma worst matchup as well. So we kind of a both uh, we were kind of like the arc arc enemies, if you will. Uh, uh, so yeah, for a long time, definitely. Um, I I I think my win ratio against Zazob is almost fifty fifty, with me having like a little bit of uh, itch. Um, so it, it really just depends on the day uh, when it comes to a tournament against Zazo. Um, and yeah, and from him, I learned a lot about Julia. But initially, when Julia just came out for a long time, for at least like two months or so, I was very frustrated at uh, playing against uh, his Julia. Yeah, but after, you know, this a uh, long kind of uh, uh, time playing against Zazo, I think uh, I, Julia has become one of my uh, most comfortable matchup. Um, I, I'm very confidently, uh, I, I can play against uh, Zazu, uh, sorry, I can play against uh, uh, most of the Julia players quite comfortably now. Yeah. Does Feng's evasiveness really help in that Julia matchup, or is it barely a factor? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't feel that Feng's uh, evasiveness uh, is really good against Julia, because... Uh, um, in my opinion, and people, a lot of people misunderstand uh, uh, Fing as a character, like misunderstands uh, what would be his best style. But in my opinion, Fing is best played in a defensive aggressive way. But this defensive aggressive way means uh, if a character can break that space control easily, that it'll be very hard for Fing. Okay, because Fing has very long arms and good keep out tools, like fold fall back. But if uh, a character can just break through that defense uh, and keep out mechanisms and easily, that would be quite hard for Fing. Uh, Julia with a party crusher, the, the uh, lash and arrow, etc. Like those are leaping forward attacking moves. Uh, and Julia is actually basically a very aggressive uh, character. No matter how you want to play Julia, Julia benefits the most when played aggressively and uh, and when playing a mix mix up kind of uh, yeah. style, in my opinion. So this in this way, it she can break uh, Fing's defense and keep her very easily. Fing does have certain tools to to keep her in check. For example, after Party Crusher, which is uh, minus two, Fing can always use back four to option select most of uh, um, Julia's uh, options. But then again, Julia has other options. For example, she could do four, 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 one, four. So Power Crusher into the four. Uh, so this is where the mind game um, starts. So yeah, it, I don't think it benefits Fing, uh, but it's not like it's an unbeatable matchup. Oh, I see. And I mean, if you could say that Jamie Zazob is New Zealand's Julia, which is which is a fair call. You oh would yes, be New definitely. Zealand's thing. You know, we're talking. You know, we were talking about mantles before. How much pride do you take in being the thing of New Zealand? Yeah. Um. Actually, like I said, in the past, like w w when I say in the past, I would say even before. I guess before uh, Tekken Seven for me at least, uh, there wasn't a concept to be the best. 
you know, uh, 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 like best player in in terms of this particular character in New Zealand. It was just kind of like everyone's competing for the best player in general yeah. in New Zealand, right? Like your top five, your top three, something like something like that. Um, there was never a thing called like, oh, he is the best thing, or he is the best, or she is the best Julia player in New Zealand. But um, I think Tekken Seven has been designed in a way that encourages people to play certain character and to kind of be expert in that character because uh, I think they give a lot of identity to specific characters, right? They kind of uh, reinforced and enlarged uh, individual identity. Uh, when it comes to character design and also like i said after the international tournaments i uh competed in which was ban and the evil and when i when i kind of uh, noticed that that i was actually the highest placed thing in those two master events like internationally i was like oh you know i started taking a lot of pride in uh, my character and definitely i feel very proud to be uh you know um like called the best fame player in uh, New Zealand, which is something I take a great pride in now nowadays. Yeah. Why is it that Fing is such a niche character, at least for our region anyway? So niche means... Oh, very small, very, very limited. Uh, I think there are many, many reasons. Uh, you know, one of the reasons being that I think... Um, Fing is not a very generic character. Like, um, yes, he does have a downfall one. He does have, but he doesn't. If you think about it, this downfall one is fourteen frames, even though it's zero on block, right? And it's a shorter in terms of the the attacking range compared to most of the characters. And he doesn't have a lot of uh, easy launching tools, uh, such as a uh, hop like uh, uppercut. Yeah. He doesn't have a. Uh, he doesn't have an uppercut. He doesn't have an orbital. Uh, he doesn't have any long range, uh, long safe launcher, so uh, he's not very generic. And a lot of players, even in the world, uh, put him in a very low tier. Like even in season three, uh, I think uh, it's widely agreed that he was uh, in the lowest tier, which is like the D tier, right? Uh, bottom ten or bottom fifteen. And even in season four, with the current buffs, I think the Japanese players. They still put him in the C tier, so he's still kind of put in the uh, bottom fifteen. Yeah, I think this might also be one of the reasons why not a lot of people play this character, uh, just because he's very different, not very generic. At the same time, um, maybe a bit difficult to play, and also uh, at at a competitive uh, level, maybe uh, you know you can't just pick up this character and be able to be. Like really, really, really strong with uh, this character. Yeah. Now he's not a, uh, and no offense to uh, Fakrum and and um, Leroy players. I, I play Leroy myself, but he's not a Leroy or Fakrum. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he doesn't have that um, explosiveness. I know what you mean. Yeah. No. Like... Yeah. It actually takes a lot of uh, years and years of experience for you to be able to use every tool he has. Uh, to achieve something that maybe a, a good character can can do within five moves. Yeah. Well, since I've mentioned that uh, explosiveness, we've just had Christmas Damager, so we've had the team tournaments. Yes. First to yes. ones, very explosive. Um, yeah. yeah. How does Feng do in a first to one setting, man? Um. Well, I guess it depends on how you play. Like in the first to one settings, obviously. Uh, characters do play into uh, a factor, but I think it also depends on how you play. Uh, generally speaking, my style is not very good in short sets because uh, uh, I need to basically understand how my uh, opponent plays, uh, be, then be able to uh, like kind of defeat my opponent. So in the short short sets, like especially first to one, I'm always kind of uh, uh, worried or scared or not so confident. But um, I think uh, in saying that, I still did quite well in this first one. I'm quite happy of uh, what I did. Um, but Fing as a character, I wouldn't say he's super good in first one. Again, like in the first one, I think a character with a lot of uh, big moves that uh, deals with a lot of damage and relatively safe would be a good character, such as Leroy, Fakram, yeah. uh, even Brian. But with Fing, he is actually quite 
like if you think about it, a lot of his moves is a uh, very low return with pretty big risks. Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't put him in a and you know I wouldn't say that he's a good character in first to one. Yeah. So tell me about. Um, the t so tell me about how you did in the team tournament. Who was in your team, and what was your objective for that day? Uh, so um, my teammates were me, Wowser, and uh, Honor Bless, uh, who is my uh, uh, basically my student. I'm officially mentoring him. Uh, my goal, well, we, we didn't really have a goal, but obviously uh, I said that on my Twitter and everything, I said that I would like to, um, you know, come first because in 2018 and 2019 my team um you know to consecutively came first so obviously i wanted to have the, you know the, the the ultimate goal is to maintain that tradition but uh, uh realistically speaking we just wanted to do uh, the best like we could yeah okay yeah interesting team it was feng kunimitsu now that uh wells is not playing alisa and yeah. geese um Yes, but yeah, um, yeah, there, it was yeah, it was a it was a fun. How did you feel that was as a wrap up for twenty twenty? Oh, that was a, it was great fun. I mean, um, you know, nationals th this year's nationals we had about one hundred ten people, maybe at most one hundred ten, one hundred twenty. And this Christmas damager, we had uh, eighty people in that bar. You yeah, know, everyone. Yeah, it was it was massive because uh, in in 2018 and 19, I believe we only had maybe like 40, 50 people at most. But this year we had like 80 people, which is like um, one third more than what we used to have. And also people were laughing, were drinking. I mean, you know, we had a we had a very strange year with the with the COVID and everything. So it was so good to see people start going back and 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 get together and enjoying Tekken, enjoying friendships and everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I agree. I think COVID played a part in the turnout. People just wanted oh, yeah. they wanted to show up and just have a sense of offlines, um, considering this year. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Did uh, did anyone did you did you happen to talk to anyone? Did anyone come up and talk to you? Uh yeah, I I I, I think I I managed to uh, catch up with a lot of uh, um, friends, you know, um, that I hadn't seen for a while. Uh, for example, I talked to Jimmy. Um, and I talked to David, and I, I also met someone I never met before, like uh, Faye, for example. I knew him from online, but I just I never I don't think I ever met him before. So um, I got to know him as well. I got to meet him, and uh, yeah, and uh, Tiny Josh, I I hadn't seen him for a while until uh, the Christmas damager. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the, I think the real hero of that night was that guy on stream right now with you. It's uh. Ah, fickle, yeah, Maki Mutt. Yeah, Maki Mutt from Tag 2 Days ah, or Tinkers. Fickle Tinkers. He had a diehard friend in the back just yelling, Go, Mark! And even <laughs> you and me were like, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Maki Mutt, uh, I, I, I've known him since uh, Tekken Tag 2. We used to play uh, online a bit. I mean, back in the day, you know, the internet wasn't very good. Uh, the net code, everything was bad, but we still kind of like played quite a bit. That's how I got to know him. Yeah, he's a very interesting, like, he's a funny dude, he's a cool guy, just, like, very fun to be with and to play against as well. And he would never, like, uh, like retreat from, like, he would consistently play you. That's, doesn't matter win or lose. So that's another thing. Oh, that's good, yeah. man. That's the kind of player you want to always have sets with. Um, yeah, exactly. So now I'll bring it back to, um, you hosted an exhibition series at your house. Yes. You chose mm -hmm. a select number of players, um, and it was mm -hmm. really great. You know, you tried to put a level of production to it. Yeah. What gave? What inspired you to run that exhibition series? Uh, so about the exhibition series. So first of all, like during the very end of season three, as we know that uh, the world was in the lockdown. You know, New Zealand was in a better place, but we still didn't have a lot of offlines going on. You know, uh, due to COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, Naimakan Bandai, they kind of like, uh, they organized the international uh, exhibition, online exhibition series, right? Uh, which includes uh, Australia, uh, America, and Europe, you know. Um, but New Zealand, we, we, we're, we're a very small nation with, uh, you know, small, a small population. Uh, therefore, we're, we've always been kind of left out of these big international, uh, you know, events uh, in terms of Tekken. So I thought, uh, okay, we're left it out, but that's okay. 
uh, we can organize one ourselves, you know? So I had a conversation with a lot of my friends, like, you know, yourself, uh, Jamie, um, 305, Yumi, etc. And they were all very keen. They were all excited about the idea. So um, I thought, okay, let's go, let's do it. Initially, I was planned to, um, initially it was planned to be released, like right before season four kicks in, you know, right before season three ends. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, everyone wasn't available. So, uh, but, but, but actually, it was good considering that it was the very, very first exhibition uh, of season four, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it was a big success. And in terms of production value, I, yeah, I, I put some effort into it because uh, I wanted to, uh, I want the exhibition to look more very professional and, you know, it'll be good for the viewers. The viewers will be able to watch the exhibition and go like, oh, this is some higher quality stuff. So I did exactly the format, like interview the players and etc. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. Sorry. No, no, you go, man. Oh, uh, no. I just thinking that also another reason for doing this is because, you know, we have a lot of new players, such as uh, good, like good new players, such as Yumi, 305, and, uh, um, you know, Honor Bless, for example, they're very willing to learn and they're showing a lot of potentials. But I guess because they're new, people, like a lot of people still don't really know about them. Yeah. So I thought, um, like, giving them a chance to show showcase their skills and also to talk about a little bit about themselves, introduce to the to the thing about themselves was very important. And that's why I did this uh, um, exhibition. One of the reasons. Yeah, I thought it was really great. You know, you did the interviews at the beginning, and then you interviewed uh, the winner at the end. What's one thing you would you would do new for the next time? Uh, new for the next time. Um, maybe I was thinking of uh, um, you know, maybe having a boss or something, <laughs> having a hidden boss. Oh, maybe yeah. uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Like that was quite interesting. And I thought uh, I would like to um, maybe uh, invite a hidden boss for the next exhibition. Well, There's something new. You could be the boss. Yeah, but I want someone who is kind of good, but at the same time maybe less exposed to the to the thing to be the boss. Yeah. That's... So um, yeah, that'd be quite interesting. And people were like, "Oh, who would be the boss? Who would be boss?" I mean, if I was the boss, people would be kind of like, "Oh, yeah, we know he he was gonna be the boss." If if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. You want you want there to be a surprise. Yes, I definitely want there to be a surprise. Okay. And for the next time, who are some of the players you would want to have in it? Um. So I was thinking of maybe. Uh, players like Tiny Josh, uh, maybe uh, like Tiny Josh is definitely on my list, and uh, maybe some people from Hamilton. You know what I mean? Some yeah. players from Hamilton, maybe like uh, Majin Buu, uh, maybe AJ. Uh, and I was because I wanted to just do this offline. If uh, if it was online, I would definitely invite Shredder, Axie, Flawless, for example, from uh, Christchurch. I think. Uh, uh, they uh, very much deserve to showcase their skills um, um, and to be more ex ex uh, boast to the to the Tekken thing. Yeah, I think it's great when you get a diverse range of players, but also they ha you have the different characters. You know, like I thought this. I thought yeah. the first one was really good. You know, it was a very good range. Yeah. Yeah, and then on top of that, yeah, definitely your set, your exhibition series, and then like prior to that, you were creating crime mystery videos. And I yes. was surprised. I would never have pinned you for a true crime mystery kind of guy. Yeah, I mean, actually, true crime has always been a, one of my many hobbies. Um, and, and um, you know, true crimes definitely fascinate me. And uh, I'm a person who likes uh, kind of like solving mysteries. And, and that's also one of the genre I like, uh, you know, when it comes to video games. It does a like pop, uh, like uh, crime solving, puzzle solving uh, type of games. Yeah. So yeah. could you, because for those who may not know, because it's you know you're speaking in your own tongue, and yeah. what what is this what is this story about? So this is uh, the very first couple of uh, uh, crime series I did, um, and this one is called in English the it's called the boy in the box. 
This this particular crime happened in the 1950s uh, in the United States in Pennsylvania. So uh, it was uh, in a on a rural road. Um, someone discovered a box, and inside the box, a little boy, uh, maybe was around about four or five years old, uh, was lying in. And so they reported to the police, and the police subsequently started investigating uh, uh, the the crime. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even after three generations of uh, uh, police investigation, like um, they still couldn't find the killer, and the killer is presumably dead because you know it's already been like fifty, sixty years, seventy years now. Um, yeah, so that's basically a, a very, very brief introduction of the crime uh, of this theory. Yeah. How many days or how many weeks? Like, how much time do you put into research into creating this into creating these videos? Uh, so, on average, I would say from doing my own research uh, till I actually make like complete a a uh, the, to the complete production, it'll at least take me a week. So I okay. so when I do my research first, I will find other you know content creators who obviously did the same story or listen to what they uh, have to present. You know, and then after that, I, I will uh, start ser doing a bit of research myself. You know, going to uh, yeah, first I do a Google search, do Wikipedia search. Then uh, I also because I work at AUT, so I have access to uh, different databases. So I would always try to use databases to look for anything like maybe was. Uh, not discovered by other content creators or something maybe new, you know, maybe there's new lead to the to the case or maybe there's a, a, some new development in the case. I will try to uh, put these into my video. So I'm trying to be entertaining at the same time presenting um, as much facts as possible. Yeah, it's interesting because the framework is already there. You're, you're stating facts and going with the info that you discover. But then yes. it's not really something that, in, in terms of being spontaneous and, and like there's li like it's solely driven by facts. Like in terms of uh, lim the limited creativity, because you can't, um, you know, like you can't, you can't half ass anything. You like you're you're going solely yeah. on facts. So how much creativity? How much? How much of it do you get out of these these videos? Um, I think the creativity uh, is actually still a big part of it. Like I know it's not a it, because it's non-fictional. It's not a fiction, so you can't just create things that's not based on facts. You know what I mean? But I think the creativity comes in two ways. One, uh, while creating the videos, you have to learn uh, the software, right? You have to also uh, visually uh, presenting um, to the viewers differently. Like sometimes you need to uh, slowly uh, start with a small uh, picture and then uh, slowly enlarge the picture so that people can have a uh, uh, have a visual effect of the of the video, not just some screenshots. Uh, that's one of the creativity, and I think uh, creativity comes in a different in another way. Like you can make assumptions yourself. Like you can you can be very clear that okay, I think this is my assumption of this case. You can make some assumptions. The assumptions doesn't need to be based on 100% facts. It can be based on logic. It, ba it, it could be based on anything, right? As long as it's reasonable. I think that's where the creativity comes in. So yes, on the one hand, it's a fiction and it's non-fictional, but on the other hand, there's still some creativity uh, within uh, this boundary and framework. If people are curious, where do they find these videos? Uh, like my videos, yeah, yeah. They can go to my uh, YouTube channel, or if they if they uh, speak Chinese, obviously because I made it in Chinese, so it's mainly targeted to Chinese audience. And that is because I think a lot of the original cases were only presented in English. So um, uh, these are very good mysteries, you know. Uh, so I think it's it's uh, it's. Uh, it, 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 the Chinese speakers who doesn't understand, who don't understand English, yeah. uh, should be able to um, 
watch them and get to know these cases as well. And that's why I'm doing it. So they can go to my Bilibili, which is a kind of a Chinese equivalent of YouTube. They can watch it from um, there as well. Yeah, I heard it got some really good views and people were really wanting more episodes. And I know you were like, you, you, you were having this talk with me about the content creation. Like as soon as you put one out there, they, yeah. they, they immediately want the next one. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I take it as a compliment because uh, that means uh, they really enjoy and they like uh, the stuff that I, I put on my uh, channel, right? But at the same time, it can sometimes be frustrating because uh, no matter how much you want to uh, satisfy your viewers, because uh, there's so many view uh, viewers, right? And everyone holds different opinion. So at the end of the day, you just kind of have to go with your own heart and go with your own philosophy, your own concept. Yeah. And if people like it, that's great. And and if there's some people that don't like it, I mean, oh, well, I'll try my best to fix things for them. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to be the one to make a decision. Yeah. So is this a series that you're continuing or are you taking a break? I'm just taking a little break uh, because uh, right now I want to focus more on uh, Tekken because of uh, Tekken... Uh, you know, seven season four coming out, and also because I think uh, uh, now that I have finally got my stream setups and I learned how to uh, like learn to streaming, yep. so I wanted to uh, stream Tekken a bit more, uh, and so I put I I call it my last uh, crime series was the f season finale, right? Maybe in the future I'll create some more, uh, but change the way I present uh, my uh, crime series. Yeah, no, it's 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 great. It's really good to see that you're streaming. Um, I never thought I'd see you stream, but yeah, streaming your games and you're doing like these little events, you know, where you're you're challenging casuals for pieces of chocolate. Um, yeah, you were yeah. Also invited to an Australian, like it was an NZ Cross Australian event. It was for the Philippines typhoon relief. So, so who who hit you up about that, and did they tell you anything else? Yeah, so uh, Brahman was the one that organized uh, this uh, great charity exhibition, and he was the one that approached me. I I had a no, um, I had a funny feeling actually before he approached me. Like just out of the blue, one day uh, Brahman texted me, and as soon as he texted me on Facebook, I was like, hmm, I think an exhibition is coming. <laughs> I I don't know why, but I just had the feeling. I just had the feeling, but obviously I didn't know it was for charity. I just thought initially I thought maybe this would be a season 4 Australia versus because the Nitco uh was improved, you know yeah. what I mean? But when he told me that it was a charity event, I felt more like there was a responsibility to put on a good show and to kind of uh push that out uh to as many um audience as possible. Because this is of a very, um, uh, like, what's the term? Noble cause, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So I felt that I also had the responsibility to put on a good show for those who are who are willing to uh, contribute or to kindly support uh, the Philippine, uh, the uh, uh, you know, to support the charity. Yeah. So when you found out your opponent was Harlem, did you know it was going to be a good show, or did you know you had to work work on it? Oh, um, I, I definitely thought I had to work on it because uh, Harlan obviously being one of the best player and um, one of the, or maybe the best, even, you know, possibly the best Julia player in Australia. He's very strong. And also uh, I played against him uh, in ranked uh, once. And, um, um, you know, my results against Harlan was always quite close. It was always kind of like one, 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 one kind of ish. Yeah. Uh, so I, when I, when I, when Brahman told me that my uh, my um, opponent was going to be Harlan, I knew it was going to be a tough game, you know? So, um, but at the same time, I was kind of like, oh, at least I, I, I'm comfortable against Julia as a character. And I kind of know how, Ju uh, I, I kind of knew how Harlan played. If I never played against Harlan before, uh, I would definitely be more scared, but I since I knew how Harlan played, so I, I felt more comfortable against uh, him, and I already had a plan before uh, before the exhibition. Okay, well, yeah, tell me about that plan, how how you were in the beginning, and then your journey throughout to the final set. Yeah, so um, 
from my experience against Harlan, and also from what other people like from the videos from the games he played against other people, I think Harlan likes to be on the aggressive side. You know what I mean? So uh, to play to defeat an aggressive player, I think there are, there are two ways: one, be more aggressive than them, or two, uh, have very solid defense that you're able to uh, uh, to block their punishable moves, right? So initially, I wanted to try the second approach, which is to have a very solid defense and uh, try to kind of like block everything Harlan does. But uh, um, I think uh, on the day, I mean, the internet wasn't as good as I hoped, uh, and I was very nervous. So was Harlan. So um, and, and you could tell, like both of us were kind of dropping combos. They were trying to, you know what I mean, uh, trying to uh, assess each other. Yeah. So. Um, like he in the first two games, he like very easily broke my defense and kind of just like uh, ran through me. Like um, uh, so in the third game, I kind of like as I calmed myself down a bit because the in the first two games I was kind of shaky, shaking a little bit. In the third game, I kind of got to know how Harlem play, uh, and I thought, okay, I can't just play this. Uh, uh, I won't be able to beat Harlem with this defensive style. So in the third game, I kind of like went on uh, on the aggressive side. So I turned on my aggressive mode. And also, I kind of got to know how, uh, like uh, Harlan's timing and what kind of moves he likes to do and what kind of uh, defense pattern he had. And that's when I started adjusting myself. But obviously, Harlan, being one of the best players, um, quickly adjusted himself as well. So at the, at the end, it was just really depend on who played the last round or last game. Uh, well, wow. and uh, yeah, and uh, based on a little bit of luck as well. Yeah. So yeah. On a scale of one to five, one mm. being pitiful and five being extraordinary, where would mm -hmm. you place yourself with your set with Harlem for the whole set? Uh, I would only place uh, maybe a six point five or seven ish, only because uh, well, we I I think. Yeah. No. I I said one. I said one to five, but you went above. Okay. So you. Oh, oh well sorry, again. sorry. A uh, one to five, not one to ten. Okay, one to five. I would say. Maybe uh, a two point five or three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the reason uh, the reason being uh, first of all, um, it was a uh, the internet quality wasn't as good. Like I like I said, I played against Harlan previously in ranked. Um, uh, the internet was actually better than uh, the, the the internet we had during our exhibition. I think mainly because. Uh, um, I, I guess the the the, the control the con, I wouldn't call it the control room or the control uh, was using Wi-Fi. Yeah. So I think it was uh, causing a bit of a lag. Um, so I dropped a lot of combos and Harlan dropped uh, dropped some combos as well. It wasn't as bad as mine, but he also dropped some combos. So um, and also I think uh, a lot of the stuff I didn't punish properly. Like uh, I missed some whiff punishment. I I even w uh, missed a block punishment. Usually I don't whiff any. Uh, I don't miss any block punishment when I play against Julia, just because I'm so familiar with Julia. Uh, I you know, uh, thanks to uh, Zazov and and thanks to a lot of the Julia players online. But uh, obviously during that exhibition, I also missed some of the block punishment. So I I I wasn't too happy about my own performance. Uh, and I think both of us, both me and Harlan, could have done better. Yeah. Well, if this exhibition series happens again, who's one player that, who's the New Zealand player that Harlan should face next? And who's the Australian player you want to face next? Uh, uh, for me, I think I would like to face anyone I actually have never, uh, or have a very, very um, few encounters against. Um, from Australia, like players like uh, Rick, Alchemist, uh, I've never played Navi before, and uh, Dion, I would like to, you know, maybe face against one of uh, these players, you know. Uh, but for Harlan, maybe, I'm not sure if Harlan uh, has played against maybe, um, you know, like Dan, has he played against Dan before? Not sure. I, 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 yeah, same here, because I know that he played against uh, um, he plays against uh, uh, Wowser quite often, mm. um, and I'm not sure if he plays against uh, uh, Dan often. I have personally never seen uh, both of them play against each other. And uh, maybe also if Zasov, you know, decides yeah, to Julie come back Mirror. to the to the thing, 
I would like to see that mirror match, you know? Yeah. Or maybe uh, against uh, like new players, like rising stars, like uh, maybe 305 or maybe even Neil. Yeah. Yeah, Neil would be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was you versus Harlem, Neil versus Lupa. I was conflicted yeah. because I was like, Neil's my boy, but then Lupa's playing my character. And then, yeah. the, and then the awesome 2v2 match with Navid, Lehman, and obviously Huang Se and Wowza. That was really good. Um, yeah. 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 So. Uh, is is that like in terms of if you were to run your own exhibition again? Is that kind mm. of the level you're aiming towards? Um. Well, uh, obviously, you want to have a very good level of players uh, to showcase their skills, and it'll be very exciting for people to watch. Uh, and uh, um, and you want to all you want to always have some very good players to be in my exhibitions. But at the same time, I think it is very important to uh, showcase the players that are maybe not yet of this level or of the highest level, but who are have a lot of potentials and who are like growing, uh, improving very fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I would like I would like to have uh, both players from you know of that top level and of level maybe as a little bit lower but fast improving to be in my exhibition. No, sweet, bro. Okay, well, I guess we can bring it to some Feng talk now. So, sure. what are your thoughts and opinions of him in season four? Was there much of a change for your boy? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, there are some buffs that Feng has received from season four. I and I think they are quite necessary, um, because uh, if you think about the top tier characters, right? And Tekken has uh, kind of like moved away from the traditional Tekken. Like the traditional Tekken, for example, DR was more about uh, defense and pokings, right? Mm. And then uh, kind of like in BR, it, it kind of still preserved that. But in Tech Attack 2, I kind of moved away from that a bit. And, and Tekken 7 kind of like is more about who has the better counter tools, who can deal with more damage from a single combo now, right? So, uh, I mean, look at Leroy, look at Fakron. They're top tier characters because they have big damage, their combo is very easy, they have very safe launches and counter tools, and Fing just didn't have any of those. But now that he got a down back three counter, uh, gets a pretty decent damage, uh, and gets follow up, mix up, I, I think it's pretty good. It's very necessary as well. Yeah. But. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the tiers, I, I'm still cautious as to, uh, you know, jumping into a conclusion. Uh, oh, uh, now Fane is uh, one tier above. Oh, now he's in uh, A tier, something like that. I wouldn't jump into that conclusion too quickly. Just because a lot of characters got buffed. And and, and the, the traditional, you know, in CN3, the S tier, even though maybe some of the characters drop down a bit, but they're still very dominant. Like Leroy, Fuck Rom. Keys, they still quite dominant, so you know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, therefore, I'm quite cautious uh, as to where Fane sits right now. Yeah. And which new move? Definitely... Okay. Well, which move are you liking more, the counter hit down back three or the new extension down forward fourth three? Uh, to be honest, I I like both of them. Um, for different reasons. Uh, down back three. Um, with this new counter hit. Uh, is very, to me, is very necessary. He should have had that in season three already, because down back three is one of his key tools. Like, I mean, even though you want to play a character as safe as possible, that's my philosophy anyway. Uh, but down back three, like, it's one of the tools that you had to use no matter how unsafe it was, and it only dealt with a little bit of uh, chip damage. Uh, it was really just for some plus frames and to to like chip away my opponent and to get my opponent uh, ducking and to get them annoyed. Basically, you know what I mean? Mm. But in terms of reward, it was a very bad reward with very high risk. But now that he has this uh, counter effect, uh, people kind of have to be more careful and it's worth the risk, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, in terms of a downfall 4-3, it's for a different reason. So in Fang was infamous for having a very, uh, like a very bad combo flexibility so he only basically had two stable combos and both of them didn't have a very good war carry and even if uh, uh, even even so 
like it only had very low was flat. So uh, a lot of the times, like a lot of occasions, you couldn't get max wall damage combo. But with this uh, new tool, a down four four three, um, it significantly improved his war carry ability and uh, uh, and the stability in terms of war combo. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's one thing that you would change yourself if you had the power for thing? Uh, for me, I I I think that a reasonable change would be his hop kick. I I kind of wish that his uh, fifteen frame Punisher, which is the hop kick, would be just like uh, everyone else's. Like instead of because right now he still has the one of the worst hop kicks in the game. Yeah. So he's got to rely on shoulder even, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So he like uh, in season three, like a lot of the minus fifteen moves. That, for example, uh, Julia's up forward. Uh, sorry, down forward two one, like the big launcher, fifteen launcher. Like even if I block that, um, like a lot of the times I couldn't punish it with uh, with hop kick. I had to use the shoulder. Or if I was fully ready, I have to do the difficult one, which is forward four back. Oh, uh, that's the yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but like that one, you have to be like really really fully ready. Uh, but your natural instinct is to hop kick right initially. Um, so I couldn't get the hop kick because of uh, how short the, his hop kick was. So um, a lot of times I had to do shoulder and Ling's Ling's uh, back turn three is another example. Now that he has this down four four three, you can always use down four four three to punish. But still, it's not a, a, a launching punishment tool. Right? Yeah. So I would love to see they gave a thing a normal hop kick instead of a short one. Yeah. So do you see or do, or do, you, do you see the change from with thing season one all the way to season four? Are you mm-hmm. ha, have you come to terms with how he is like in terms of his growth or are you still kind of debating it in your mind? I think fundamentally speaking, he is still the same you can still play him the same way but i i do see that where the game is kind of uh, headed toward like if you think about it um one of the tools that they uh buffed uh, like one of the things that they they buffed the thing was uh his one plus two which is a punch parry yeah so um i think what they're trying to do is they're trying to make punch parry or like parry in general like um a, a kind of um, a key tool for a lot of characters. So Leroy obviously you need to use his parries, uh Asuka and and um and Law. And they I think they're trying to give a thing a similar kind of uh game plan as well. Mm-hmm. So now you know uh, you could do a lot of setup, a lot of save setups. After that you can use a uh, punch parry as a, as a follow up, right? So your opponent has to play the mind game whether I was going to, you know, whether I'm going to uh, 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 do the punch parry or not. I personally, I don't really like this idea, but at the same time, like, I see it as a as a one extra option that I can use to kind of mind game my opponent. So I definitely welcome this change, um, even though like I personally don't really like this concept. But it's not something that I I would like actively oppose against as well. Yeah, I hear you, man. Yeah. All right. Well, are you ready for your final round segment? Yeah, sure. Sweet, man. All right. First up. Oh, no. No. This one. What's the best fighting game name you've seen in the NZFGC? Best fighting name in uh, FCC. Uh, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, Best fighting names. Uh, I, I guess the Holy Emperor. Oh, yourself. <laughs> okay, all right, then, man. All right. Just because I like uh, the Holy Emperor from the Fist of Not Star, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, nice. Okay, what's the best wine you've ever had? Ah, uh, best wine I've ever had. I, 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 I don't remember, but I, I can tell you something. I want, I, I want to try in the future, in the near future. 
Yeah. So um, recently, I came across a video showing, you know, the very traditional old uh, British style of drinking wine. Uh, so basically, they put wine into a metal jug and they heat it up, not to the point it will boil the wine, but just to warm up the wine. And then in another different jug, they will put some cinnamon and a type of herb and two spoon of sugar, and then mix them together. And then pour the already warmed wine into the jug and mix them up and put some uh, grounded ginger on the top. Uh, I think it's a great drink that I want to try. It's very traditional British, uh, I think, a uh, wine style. Okay. Oh, that yeah. Sounds really nice. Okay. How would the NZ Ticken scene describe your play style? Uh, I, I think the... Uh, I, I think I would like to talk more about uh, this one because I think the New Zealand Tekken thing would describe my style as the push you, push you, or the push, push. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they, they think I am a very aggressive player who pushes button a lot. Uh, but I think this is kind of like a meme and, and it's kind of like a, a, a misunderstanding. Uh, the people that know about this main knows exactly what this means, but the people who actually don't know about this main actually think that this is my play style. Yeah. But it is uh, so, but it is not. So I have a very Japanese uh, tech and play style. So um, which seemingly I push a lot of buttons, but I push buttons when I know when I get to know my opponent when I uh, when I studied my opponent's timing and habits. And when I think I can take advantage of my opponents by uh, being aggressive, that's where I start push a lot of buttons, right? But my base style is actually quite defensive. It's it's a active defense style, which means I keep my distance. I don't actually go in. Uh, I do a lot of keep outs, right? Instead of blocking. So it, let's say Wowser's basic style is very defensive. He always backdash and wait for people to whiff or using movement to bait people's whiff and then punish. My style is backdashing, using keypal to bait my opponent to come in. Yeah. And uh, trade a, a few jets to test my opponent's timing and to test my opponent's um, defense habits, let's say, and uh, offensive habits. And once I get to know, I start mixing up and uh, uh, cash in on my reads. That's that is my um, play style. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. Right, martial law or Lei Wulong? Uh, definitely Lei Wulong because uh, he's the most annoying character in the game for me. <laughs> Same for me, man. Same for me. Oh yeah. I All think right. everyone would agree on this one. All right, I'll be. I'm surprised to hear this one. Name one time you've disrespected your opponent. Name why I have disrespected my opponent. Uh, I I don't really think I've uh, actually disrespected my opponent in Tekken Seven at all. Uh, I guess maybe sometimes online when I encounter like serious trolls that who would dis uh, like key charge or taunt middle of games. Then I, if if they annoy me a lot, then I try uh, I will disrespect them after I beat them and then and then win quick. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Should there be less or more Chinese martial arts styles in fighting games? Well, uh, being a Chinese person myself, I would say that I'm biased on this one. But I think they should put more uh, Chinese martial arts styles in fighting games. Why? Because uh, there's still a lot of the different Chinese martial arts styles that have not been pl uh, put into uh, fighting games yet. Uh, Tekken, for example, they still don't have the uh, the uh, the Primantis style. You know, in VR Fighter, they have this character that does the traditional um, Chinese Primantis style, uh, but that is not in Tekken, yeah. and it's a beautiful style. If they with the modern uh, animation technology and with the modern concept of Tekken, I think if they put that style into Tekken, it'd be a big success and it'd be really interesting. Okay, okay. All right. What's one thing you think can't be taught but learnt over time when competing in Tekken? Uh, I think the hardest thing to teach, and but it's learned over time, is the concept of uh, fundamentals. 
you know, or, or neutral. Yeah. Like to say this person has very good fundamentals or very good neutral, like it could mean a lot of stuff. To me, it means uh, good space control like, or spacing, good punishment, a good understanding of uh, the, the game, the system, and good matchup knowledge. You know, these things, right? Uh, while some of these things can be taught, a lot of things just, um, it, it can't be, like, even if I teach you, oh, you need to have a good spacing, but what exactly is good spacing is not something that can be verbally taught. Mm. It has to be practiced and gained over time by playing the game, playing against different matchups, etc., different styles, different opponents. Yeah, no, good answer, man. All right, what does an emperor need to make him look powerful? Uh, what does an emperor need? I, I think the emperor needs to win every competition uh, having all the gold medals <laughs> on him. <laughs> Gee, nice. Uh, yeah. All right. And who is your waifu, Mysterious River? Uh, so that would be Clear Redfield in Resident Evil and uh, Julia in uh, Tekken. I mean, I, I hate Julia so much before, but at the same time, I like her design. She'll definitely be my waifu. Wow. This is a hate and love relationship. A, a definite. And that's the best. Yeah, a definite love hate relationship. Hey, thanks again, Mysterious River. Um, no problem. Do, do, do you have any last words or shout outs for your friends or family or the people who follow you? Yeah, um, I, I'll, yeah I, I would like to say uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to uh, NZFGC. I know that we have been through a very tough year. And uh, in 2021, I know for a lot of us, there'll still be a bit of a challenge. You know what I mean? Like, um, But I want to say that let's be positive, And I hope like everyone will have a great 2021 and best luck uh, to everyone.